All right, so again, welcome to the Advisor's Guide to Navigating Engage. Today we're going to walk through several features starting with the Explore page of Engage. And so my first tip would you, to you would be if you log into Engage and this is not the view you see, you likely aren't signed in. There would be a blue sign in button up here in your top corner. Make sure you sign in and authenticate. That's going to be what helps you connect to the actual organization you advise. We're going to use some sample organizations today to use their management tools. Know that already when you log into your Engage profile under memberships, you should see that organization that you advise. If you do not see that organization there, you might have a flashing light right here that says pending invitation. You would want to click on that and accept it so that organization would then pop up here in memberships for easy access in the future. If you don't see a pending invitation or your organization there, that means they haven't added you to the roster. You're welcome to connect with me by email and I can get that squared away for you. Also another benefit during this time of year is that student works are going through re-registration and so they'll actually be forced to correct that error through the re-registration process as we require every organization to list their faculty and staff advisor on the roster. It is up to you though to accept that invitation so we would ask that you do that. We're going to go in and use a sample organization. I'm going to use the Leadership and Service Council as our sample organization today. And so when you click on that membership, where you're going to want to go to manage the organization is this Manage Organization tool here. We're going to click on this and walk through the resources available to you as an organization manager through your faculty staff advisor role. The first thing I'll point out is when you open this page, if there's ever a time available for re-registration, that blue button is going to be prompted there. One of the questions that I typically receive from our, um, I don't know, meet some people, there's some background noise. Some of the questions I typically receive during our um, re-registration periods would be who has to submit this? Is it an organization advisor's responsibility to submit this or is it a student leader's responsibility? I would say that depends on the organization. However, I'm always going to recommend that responsibility component to be delegated to a student leader when possible. I do think it's supportive for an advisor to know about the re-registration process and to encourage an organization to go in and do that in a timely manner, as well as know how to access it. So again, if you're telling your org to go in and submit this, you would tell them to go click on this blue re-register button. Any student with an officer position will be able to do that. If you're in a time of year where maybe leadership transitions got very chaotic due to COVID or you just don't have that primary contact for your organization quite yet, y'all are going to do elections this fall, there is nothing wrong with you going in and submitting this re-registration. Just know it was created with a student in mind. So some of the language you're going to see in there is more centered towards a student experience opposed to an advisor one. And so if you don't see this, that means your organization has already submitted re-registration. So that is a good sign. As a reminder, re-registration closes at the end of August for our current orgs. The management access features are going to be up here in this three little drop down. So you see it, it's real small up here in your top left corner. By clicking on that, you're going to see a number of options for you to utilize here. The first of which is going to be home, which is going to take you back to where you are currently. We're going to just work our way down each of these menu options to really thoroughly review the resources that are found within them, with the first one being the roster. All right, so when you open your roster, there's a few things I would encourage you to make sure are correct. The first being this primary contact. So here you can see Andrea Bennett is listed as the primary contact for this organization. She is actually the faculty staff advisor and they have intentionally made her the primary contact. 
The purpose of a primary contact is for any engaged communication. And so let's say on the organization's home screen, which I'm gonna go back here and show you that, if a student that was not an officer in this organization looked at the home screen for that org through the organization directory up here where they would see that list of orgs, they would always see this contact button. So if I clicked on this contact button here and show you what a student would experience, they're gonna be able to select the subject, so maybe they're interested in getting involved with the organization, or maybe they're wanting to collaborate, for example. They're gonna be able to send the body of an email and then send their message. What's gonna happen, as you can see over here, is that primary contact will receive that message through their UAB email address. So it won't go to engage, it's gonna go straight to the primary contact's UAB email address. In order to ensure those emails are answered, because we do get complaints from students who are looking to join organizations that those emails go unanswered, you want to ensure that primary contact is up to date and that the person who has assigned that role is aware that that would be communication they would be receiving. In this instance, the organization decided the faculty staff advisor would be best suited to kind of filter through those communications as they receive them. You might prefer that your organization secretary receives them. I know that that's what I do with the ambassadors that I advise, but the organization can decide who this person is. It is automatically updated through the re-registration process. So whoever submits re-registration will automatically be made the primary contact. However, once re-registration is approved, you can always come in and edit it by clicking the pencil mark, searching for the person, or selecting through the list of options here. The next features you're gonna see is a messaging option as well as managing positions. And I'm gonna go through them in a little bit more detail, but first I wanna scroll down and check out the actual roster. So you can see here that there's five individuals on this roster. You can also see over here in the third column that most of these have positions associated with their name. And so for example, if the organization created a brand new position, let's say that y'all started an event director that was responsible for submitting Engage events, and you wanted to add that position to that individual on Engage, you would just use this pencil mark over here and you would go and assign that position to them. Let's say you look through this list of positions and you just don't see exactly what you're looking for. That's okay. I'm going to show you how you can add a position as well. I'm going to save that there to update and add that position I've assigned. And now I'm going to show you how to add a position. So if we didn't see that list, we would come up to manage positions. And I'd first recommend that you take a look at everything that's in here. These have been pre-populated for you just to make this process easier. However, if that position doesn't exist, you can add a position. We will label this sample position for the purpose of this tutorial. This piece is really important. You're gonna to wanna to make this an officer if you intend for them to have any management access and engage. Another way people typically use positions is if they want to send mass emails, which I'm gonna show you how to do, they just want a general body position. And you could create that. In that case, you would want to leave it as a member. But if you want them to access engage, be sure that you put that as an officer there. You're going to want to make sure it's active and then you have the option of showing this position on a public roster and so that would be up to the organization as to whether or not they wanted that to show on the public roster through the organization landing page. I will also share that each individual student does have access to update their personal privacy settings to remove that, um, that option for them personally if they didn't want it on the public page. You can also now add, and you see it's new, Engage is constantly updating to receive contact forms from emails. So I showed you that piece first where Andrea was the contact through the primary contact feature to receive those emails. Let's say that you wanna make sure the president, secretary, and new member educator all receive those contact emails. You could simply come in and edit an existing position as well and check that box to receive those contact emails. 
the management access is going to be important as well. And so if you want a student to have all access to everything on Engage, it's simple. Just click all access. However, sometimes organizations don't want certain officers to have access to forms. I'll give you an example. Some organizations may use the form feature as a way to submit accountability complaints if a student has seen another member not upholding the standards as were written in the Constitution. In that event, you would want to do limited access and then make sure that the forms would be none for those students, but you could make all the other options either be view or full. The difference between view and full is they would be able to view events that were submitted. Full is going to give them access to actually submit an event on the organization's behalf. And so consider it as like levels of access. Most of the times for my student organizations, I tend to give them all access if they're an officer. I've found that the students really benefit from that because they get creative in the ways that they can use Engage. However, the organization when you create this position can decide what level of access you should have there. Each of the options listed here are really the options available to you through that drop down menu I first showed you. And then you click create. So we're going to create this position. We'll go back to our roster. And then we're going to go add that. So we'll add it to Andrea's title here. We should see sample position. There it is. And we would save it and that would add to her list of positions within Engage. And so that's how you can add positions um, to each individual's title. It's not required that they have a position. Every member will have the position of member and that's for the purpose of messaging, which we'll look at now. So again, through the roster, which you just accessed from this drop down menu, you can also send mass emails to your organization. I feel like this is one of the most underutilized tools by our faculty staff advisors, which could be really beneficial to you. Here you can see Andrea has created several mass communications. We're going to create a relay and so I can show you how that would work. Mass emails are actually called message relays within Engage and it's a three step process. First, you want to select your recipients. And so you can do this in two different ways. You can either send it to certain positions or to specific members. I have found typically it's easier to send it to certain positions. For example, if I click edit, if I wanted to send it to every member of the organization, including officers, I would click member and it's going to send it to every member in the organization. You can see that updated. You can see the current roster is at five and it's sending to five people. Or let's say I just want to send it to the executive board. So I might choose to send it to the president, secretary, and treasurer. Once I do that, let's see, I can't see my little save button down here. There it goes. Once I do that, it's going to only send this message to those individuals. So you have some flexibility in terms of who you're going to generate this message for. Let's say you don't want to send it to any positions. You could just unclick those. And then you want to send it to a specific member. Like maybe I just want to email Charity and Dominique. I could do that as well. And it's going to send it to those two specific students. You're then going to in, um, insert a subject line, so we'll drop one that we've used before, and then you're going to click Generate. When you click Generate, it's going to provide you with a link here. When you click on this link, that's going to automatically open in whatever email browser you're using. So for example, if I had my Outlook open on my desktop, this is going to open in Outlook. I'm not going to click open right now because it's going to mess up our screen share, but know that that's where it would go. When you click it, it's going to open in Outlook and that address here, this long address from uh, RelayEngageCampusLabs.com, it's going to show up in the two line. Leave that as is add your subject, add the content to your email, and then press send. When you do that, it's going to automatically send it to the members or positions you specified when you created the message relay. It's um, going to go from your email, so if anyone replies to it, it's going to come back to your email. So that chain of communication is really fluid there, and I think that that's helpful um, for org advisors as you're looking to communicate to a large group but still want that direct connection with the student. And so that's it. Once you do that, it'll send automatically. Um, the student will receive it if they choose 
choose to reply, it'll come back to your email. And so again, I think that that's a really helpful feature, especially for some of our orgs that have pretty extensive membership rosters. As your students are adding them to the roster, you could go in and communicate them, communicate with them pretty easily. And so that is your messaging feature. So we're gonna go back to the roster. There's a couple of other things I wanna point out here. You can invite people to join throughout the year. So let's say a student comes to you or your president says, hey, we met this really cool transfer student. We wanna add them to the organization. We're not sure how to do that on Engage. They can invite the person by clicking this blue button, simply type in their email address, click add email address, and then they can assign a position. Again, if they're just a member, leave that as member and send the invitation. That student will have to accept the invitation. They will receive an email from Engage in their UAB inbox that will um, really share that and it's just a click to accept, but that will officially add them to the roster. So that's how you can invite people. Once you invite someone, you would see it as a pending invitation. And so here there's not any pending invitation, but if you did, you could always resend that invitation if someone was slow to respond. Let's see, someone had a question here. Do the students get the email in Engage or their UAB account? That's a great question, Chelsea. Thanks for asking. They will actually get the email to their UAB account. It will come from Engage, so it will look like it's a message from Engage. So you need to tell them, hey, check your emails. I'm going to send you things from Engage. Um, but it will go straight to their Outlook account. If they reply to it, it will come straight back to your Outlook account. And you can put at the bottom like it's from you so that they'll know. But the direct receipt address will be Engage. Good question. Keep the questions coming. If y'all have any, that chat feature will be great for that. So again, you could resend an invitation if there was a pending invite the student still hadn't accepted. You can also see here if there's perspective. Um, most of the time your organization accounts won't have this listed. That's when there's a join button at the top. I've turned that off for all registered student organizations due to some complaints that I received in the first two years of us having engaged with leaving that as an option. We can't allow an org to individually turn on that option. It has to be for all organizations or none. And so currently that's for none. So you really shouldn't see this perspective option. Terms and conditions aren't going to be relevant for our functions here at UAB either. So those two last two are really irrelevant for us. And that is a quick overview of the roster. Are there any questions about the roster? Feel free to unmute yourself if so. All right, we'll keep moving. So the next tool is about. Bear with my slow internet. So this is where the organization's primary information is listed. So this is the information that if a prospective member was looking through the organization directory and clicked on that organization's um, profile. So we'll go in here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's say a student was browsing the org directory and clicked on this organization. This is where they find information about that group and so it is essentially the about component in the management feature so if you want to edit this stuff you can do it through about and so you can never edit the official organization name that is an admin tool however if your organization goes through the process and wants to make a name change i encourage them to wait till a re-registration period if it is urgent they can contact the student involvement office and we can make that change on their behalf this is where you could edit the description. This is the part found in the org directory, that full description that's on the organization's page, contact information, this part is optional, external websites, as well as the faculty staff advisor information. If at any point throughout the year, let's say that you're, you have to go on maternity leave, for example, and you can no longer serve the organization, it is the organization's responsibility to find a proxy or new faculty staff advisor. So that is on them in terms of responsibility. However, we would really appreciate if you all could encourage them to go in and update this section on about so that we do know who that new and acting advisor is. We'd also like that individual to complete the advisor verification form. So they could list that information here and click update. 
So about is pretty straightforward. You can add a profile picture if you want to. It's really just to edit that information submitted through re-registration. The next feature is events. So the events tool is gonna give you a few options here. You can create event or view existing events. First, we're gonna look at the create button feature so I can show you a few tools through that. And then we'll come back to see how you all can manage an event. And so using the create event button, this is what we refer, refer to as the event registration process. So if you ever hear a student say, you know, I'm required to submit this event for the event registration process, this is what they're referring to. Anytime the create event button is used, it is submitted to our office. And so the student involvement team of professional staff um, have alternating days where we're each reviewing events. What we're doing through this review process is looking for obvious mistakes. So we want to ensure this information is accurate, well thought out, stated thoroughly, so it would be understandable for someone looking to attend an event. But we're also looking at that risk mitigation component. So we ask a, a series of risk identifiers that allows us to better support organizations and make recommendations for them. One of those recommendations could potentially be advisor attendance for those events. Um, there's a number of criteria that's outlined in the student organization handbook that helps us determine that criteria and those risk indicators we're looking for when advisor attendance is required. Know if that's ever the case if an organization contacts you and says, hey, I was told you have to attend this event. You can help the organization identify a faculty or staff proxy. We recognize this is a voluntary role on top of your primary assignment, um, but we would require a faculty staff member to be present for the duration of that event if we indicated that. If you were to come in and create an event, you would provide a title, a theme, a description, and then you could add a co-hosting organization. A question I actually recently got is that a department and an organization is co-hosting an event or two student organizations are co-hosting an event. As long as they have an engage page, you could list that co-host here. So I'm gonna type in student involvement and leadership. It should automatically pop down. There it goes. All right, and I'm gonna add them as a co-host. You'll add the date, time, end time, at an online location. This year, we're gonna require all virtual events be posted to Engage. They could provide those Zoom instructions here, the Zoom link here. I'm gonna cancel that because we're not gonna do it for this example. If they want a physical location, they could add that as well. You're gonna select your visibility settings. And so we'll say that this is only open to students and staff at Engage. When you set it to the public, that's gonna show on the public facing component of Engage, which means anyone with the Engage link could access those event details. If you're using a Zoom link, I typically recommend that you do students and staff at Engage just to help us protect that link from Zoom bombers. You can add event categories. So let's see, I'll add dialogue, for example, as a category here, as well as educational. You can add as many categories as you want, and that's how students filter through events to find things that interest them. And then perks, I think this one's a lot of fun. You know, if y'all are giving credit, um, maybe it's membership credit, you could click credit here. Or if you're giving away something, let's say a student gets a free t-shirt if they come, you can do free stuff there and students can filter by that category as well. You click the next button, and I forgot to put a location, so it's going to force that. Right, and click next. And now this is one of the features that I really wanted to share with you all. I would say for the most part, students in general don't really understand or value an RSVP. I know that that's a challenge I have with my student organizations, encouraging them to RSVP to something sometimes. But you do have features within Engage that allows you to create an RSVP for an event. I think this year as we operate remotely, this tool is gonna be really helpful for us to create anticipated attendance 
attendance so we can better prepare for that event, be it virtual or a low contact event in person. So if you want to create an RSVP, you can let anyone RSVP or only invitees, and I'll show you later how to invite someone to an event or no one. If you don't want to RSVP, that's fine. You just click that and it'll take it away. In this case, we're going to let anyone RSVP. We're going to say we're doing a, a, an event in the HSC, and let's say we can only have 10 people attend. We're going to put that maximum capacity there. You can even show the remaining amount of options available to people looking to RSVP. You can allow guests if you want to and limit those as well. I found that this feature is helpful if I'm hosting like an induction ceremony and I'm allowing them to invite family. You can also ask them to represent an organization. So if you're hosting something where you're inviting other student organizations, you could give that as an option. You don't have to, you can leave it blank there. And then you can create RSVP questions if you want to. So let's say you wanna do a needs assessment prior to the start of the event. You could simply come in, select your type of question, add the question where it's gonna let you type in your question and then type in answer options. Once you've done this, you could indicate whether it's required or not. If you wanna add another question, you can, but you're not forced to, and you'd go to next. That's gonna automatically then create a blue RSVP button for your potential participants to click on when they navigate to that event on Engage. The other feature I wanted to highlight within event registration is post-event feedback. This is a relatively new Engage feature that allows organizations to immediately, without much extra effort, collect or send out a survey to collect information in terms of satisfaction or other information on how their event went from their participants' perspective. And so they can click to automatically send out the survey following the event. That does require that they track attendance, which I can show you all how to do when we manage an approved organization event. They would add a question just like we did in the RSVP options. We'll add that question and then maybe we will say, tell us what you thought about the event. And we can leave that open-ended for them. You can add an, a different kind of question, as many questions as you want. This will keep pre-populating until you finish with the full survey that you're wanting to send. And then you would click next. I'm not going to continue this afternoon through the event registration process because I anticipate that some of the questions that are currently there are going to look a little different once the university releases guidelines and expectations for student organization events and activities. I know that you've probably been asked that by your students and I want to share that as of today we still have not received that guidance, though we do expect that in the coming weeks with a pretty firm deadline of being August 17th. Um, however, we anticipate that being shared or we hope that will be shared before that time. So hang in there with us as we wait on that. And so we're going to go back a few steps um, to get back to that event management view before we created this event. And I'm going to show you once that event is approved what you will see. And so we're going to look at these down here. And so you can see serving while socially distanced, it was approved, the date that it was supposed to happen. And then you have these action options over here. And so the one that says view and explore, that would be your students view of it. Okay. This one is a certificate that would show that who attended that. You could send that to someone if they needed to verify they attended, or you could delete this from this list. You can add attendance here, or you can manage the event by clicking back in the name of the event on this side. We're going to start there. So when you look at the managed view of the event, let's say the organization changed the name of the event, event details, location, whatever the case is, you could come in and change details here. That's gonna push you straight back through the registration process. We do have to review any changes before they're published. And so that's what that piece would be. You can also track attendance. This would be the same thing as that add attendance button that you saw earlier um, in that previous screen. I'll show you how to do that, but first I want to point out two pieces that are associated to tracking attendance. 
The first of which is this access code. The access code is used when you use the engage event pass. And so if you want to use the engage event pass to track attendance, that's a kind of a whole other conversation I'd be happy to connect with you about and send you some resources. All student organizations have access to use that app to scan in a student's event pass, which is a QR code like a boarding pass that's specifically for that student. You would need this access code to use that. So that's one way to track attendance. Another new way to track attendance is in your virtual um, events. And so let's say you're hosting a Zoom session. I could copy this URL, open up the chat, drop it in here, and you could click on that or tell your uh, participants to click on that URL. It would require them to log in to engage. And as soon as they log in to engage, this number here in the middle that says attended, that would automatically start to grow to show us that someone has logged in and verified they attended the event using that link. Once they do that, you could go into this track attendance button, this blue button here. And you're going to see that number as well as their name and blazer ID and email address for any student that attended. This is really helpful. I have found specifically if I want to connect with those students that attended post event, maybe to invite them to another event or to invite them to be a member of the organization. Um, a lot of times students aren't tracking attendance readily unless they've had an experience in another organization where they had success doing that. So I would encourage to talk to your students about tracking attendance. It's a great way to, for them to really better understand who attended and to have that bank of individuals to connect with for future opportunities. They can export that. That's going to put it in a CSV file, an Excel format for them to save into their Google Drives or however the organization really um, collects documents as well. And so that's just another option there. You can manually add attendance. So it will always happen. Someone's link doesn't work or they're on their phone and can't do it from their phone. You could just say, well, shoot me your Blazor ID. I'll add it for you. When you click that add attendance, you'd go to text entry. You would scroll down. You would just type in their email address, mark them as attended and add. So it's pretty easy to manually do that as well. And so that is really your event feature. Are there any questions about events? It looks like I might have someone in chat. Yeah, Matt's asked, how do we know if an event is open to everyone or closed to group members only? Is there a designation on the event listing? And so I'm having to think that through, let's see. So the event listing is when you go to the engage screen and click on the events list at the top, that's gonna be your event directory. If you can see it, it's open to you. Um, most events, I will say most events from student organizations, they're making them public and open to everyone. And so whatever, you're logged in through your user account. So again, if you can see it, that means it's open to you. I'm gonna see all events because I'm an admin. You could click on the event, and this is what our students are doing to learn more to see additional information. But again, it's not saying if it's closed to someone or not. A student just wouldn't see it if it wasn't an option for them. So if you were making an event, went back when we were creating that event through the registration form, if you selected invited members only or you selected organization members only, only people on that roster would see the event as an option here. Matt, I know that you post our events onto the campus calendar. If y'all didn't know that, that's something I should definitely highlight. Matt does a really great job at supporting engagement by helping us transition any event posted on Engage that's relevant over to the campus calendar. And so Matt, me and you could look at that a little closer um, if you're wanting to filter out, um, especially if a, an organization listed something as private, we would want to make sure we're doing that. And I believe right now we are. Um, but yeah, we'll connect about that maybe offline. Any other questions about events? All right. Well, the next feature is news. This is a really underutilized feature of Engage. However, we run Google Analytics on the Engage platform on a monthly basis and our news articles actually really receive a lot of clicks. And so I would encourage you and your organizations to consider making use of this news feature. 
news is pretty simple. You just create an article using this blue button and it sort of walks you through what's required. So you're required to have a title, a summary, that's good, what's gonna show up in the news directory up at the top if a student were to look for news. The body of your information, you can embed videos here. So I've also found that this is a pretty good training resource because once you create a news article, you can copy that hyperlink and send it to other people or drop it in a link tree for social media, link in bio, um, because you can embed those videos. You can notify members anytime a news link um, or a news article is posted. You don't have to do that. I typically don't notify the members because when I'm using news, I'm trying to attract potential members. You can upload a file here that would be the image or the, the cover photo for your image. When you go to upload a file, it is gonna give you recommended dimensions. Well, actually it didn't for me. I'm not sure why it always messes up when I'm given a demo, but there are recommended dimensions and I'm not seeing them right here, but you should see that. I think it's actually once you upload it, it lets you crop it and tells you what those dimensions are. You would create your article. Once you create your article, it's going to show up in this news tab here. So you can see here, there's a path to Penalinic, virtual UFIT, et cetera. Lots different, a lot of different types of news posts. It's also going to show up if a student logs in to engage and they scroll down on the explore screen. It's going to show up here under latest news and those just pop up in the order that they're submitted. And so the last one that was submitted was the path to Panhellenic on August 5th. And so that's a, again a good tool people underutilize that I would really recommend your organizations consider, especially if they're um, recruiting new members. It's a great way to embed a video that tells about their organization, for example. The next feature is gallery. So the benefit of having a gallery is that if you upload four pictures at a minimum to your gallery, it's going to show up on the organization's homepage. And so I'm going to select an organization who has that. So the Pathfinders, for example. They've uploaded four pictures of Pathfinders who are members so that when a student comes in and looks at this organization's page, it makes it a little bit more creative and visually appealing because there is some visual content there. And so if you create that content through the gallery, it would automatically, the first four photos would show up here. And so that's the primary way student organizations are using it. I'll also show you, and I'll use the Pathfinders as an example, if you manage their organization, go into their gallery. I'm gonna click on their album here. If you were to look at a picture, so when you open it, right click and do copy image address, that's the way you can insert pictures into forms on Engage. And we haven't quite got to forms, but I wanted to go ahead and highlight that is an option and you'd have to put it in your gallery to later insert it into a form. So that's another way some student organizations are using the gallery. So this is optional. I would say not every organization by any means uses that feature, but it's something that they can use if they want to. The documents management tool is where every organization's constitution and bylaws lives. And so this is required to be uploaded through re-registration and that's gonna be living in this section. It will be locked in that section. If they wanna make an update to that, they would have to go through our office to submit an updated constitution and bylaws. And that's because we wanna verify the non-discrimination clause as a component of that. They can also update two times a year during um, re-registration periods, which happen both in the summer from July to August and in the fall from December to January. Here they can add other documents. So you can see, for example, this organization has created a folder for committee documents, general documents, service events, and this would be a way for the organization to really have one location that's centralized that all members have access to, to store that information. It's pretty self-explanatory. You can add a file or create a folder. One thing that I actually really enjoy about this is once you create a document, so I'll use this records release for example, you can use these three buttons over here and you can share it. And that's actually gonna give you a link 
to share it. I found that that's really useful instead of dropping attachments in everywhere. If I want to embed a document into a news post, that gives you a, a great way to create a link without having to create a website. And you'll stop me if you have any questions as we go. The next management tool is forms. This is my personal favorite. You can do so much with a form. As you can see here, this organization has several forms that are created. Some of my favorite ways to use a form are to gather information from our members. So let's say at the beginning of fall, you all wanna gather cell phone numbers. This would be an easy way to do that. Or let's say that there's a summary report at the end of each month you want your officers to do. You could create a form for that. Um, let's say you want to do an interest form for any pers uh, prospective member that you wanted to publish through a link to put as a link in bio on social media. You can do that through forms. And so forms can be really used in a variety of ways. I'm gonna show you today how to build a form. So when you click on forms, the first thing you're going to do is use these three little dots over here in the top corner. Right click and you'll do create form. When you create a form, you're first going to be required to put in the properties. So we'll do a test form. We're going to go ahead and make that active. You have to click this button for a student to be able to see it. You can set the start date, end time. You could make this be open for five years if you wanted to. Um, and a lot of times orgs do that if it's an interest form or something like that. You can enable an approval process. So if you want to approve or deny a form, or let's say it's one of those things where you are just taking interest from people or you want to collect cell phone numbers, you don't need to approve that. You can mark that as no review required and it's gonna essentially just let that student know we received their form. You can allow submissions from public users. So this is oftentimes helpful. Let's say if you're recruiting community partners, y'all create a form through the orcs profile, but you want someone who's not affiliated with UAB to be able to fill out that form. You could do that by clicking this. If you don't click that, that's going to require anyone that fills out the form to authenticate to access the form. You can allow a student to submit it one time or 10 times. If you want 10 times or more than one, you would click multiple submissions here. This is where you would really identify someone at, or the student that's filling out the form would identify someone who should review. We very rarely use this. This is a new feature. For example, if a student wanted to have their advisor um, review a form and we allowed them to do that, we would have to click this and then say, please add your advisor's email address so that you could review the form. We're rarely using that, but it is a tool that's available if you want to use it. And then lastly, if you only want this form available to your executive council, you could click those individuals titles here and that form would only be available to those positions. If you don't click any of these restricted positions, it will be available to anyone that has access to the form link. You would click save. That's going to update those properties for you. You can also add reviewers and this is one of the pieces I really enjoy about forms. When you add a reviewer, you could add yourself, for example, you just use this little blue icon over here. I'm gonna type in my name. There I am, you could add yourself. What you do when you become a reviewer is you receive an email every time someone submits the form. I find that this helps me go back to look at the submissions, or let's say that you don't need to see who's submitting the form, you just help the org by creating it. You could assign the org's president. Um, or an officer, for example. When you assign that person to review the form, you can see we're gonna add them as a reviewer. It will save it and show up there. You can add as many reviewers as you want. And so that's usually helpful if you're adding an entire executive board. We'll go back to form properties now that we've added reviewers. And we're gonna build our form questions. So we'll go to save and add questions. There's a lot of flexibility with what this form looks like. 
each of these eight options across the bottom are different form fields you can collect. So if you just want to share a message, you could add instructions. If you want to embed a video, you could drop that in instructions. If you want to make them provide a reflection on an event, you could create a text field. If you want them to upload a waiver to be able to go to something, you could create this file upload feature, for example. So there's a lot of different options here. One thing that I want to highlight is the option to use conditions. So if you click on page properties, you can name your page. We'll name this Summer 2020 Profile Updates. So I'm going to name my page. That'll show up there. I'm going to add a question. So I'm going to say sample question, answer options are A or B. My question will show up there. If I add a page after this, so click this um, little plus symbol there, and then go to page properties, and you'll see a conditions button then. I can add a condition to where I'm selecting that question and saying if they answered B, they need to fill out these additional questions. And then I could ask a follow-up question on this second page for students who have indicated a specific answer. This is really helpful for training purposes, um, or let's say that you're using this to gauge satisfaction with their organization experience. If someone said that they were very dissatisfied, you could use those conditions to have a follow-up question. And so there's a lot of opportunity and engage. You can create as many pages as you want and make this form as long as you want. The one thing I recommend at the very end is to add a note, and I typically do this by instructions, that says click the blue button to submit on the next page. That would be the last thing that person sees because oftentimes, and I say oftentimes, sometimes students forget to click submit. And so just giving them that last gentle nudge helps to ensure that that form actually gets submitted. And so that's how you create a form. I think that that's a super useful tool. I hope that y'all will be able to make use of it as well. You can see there's a lot of options for filtering within your forms once they're created, um, which is really helpful. I'll also show you once a form's created, if there's submissions, you'll see this little orange exclamation mark. If you were to click on that, you could go down and view those submissions. Depending on what you wanted to make either an approval process or a receipt process, you would need to filter. So if you put received, you'd need to click that. If you said it approved or denied, they would be either be in one of these top three. But you can see those there. You can click to view that form. You can print the form. You can approve or deny if you set that as an option. When you approve it, you can provide a closing comment. That's going to be emailed directly to the student to let them know it's been approved with any additional content. You can also have a discussion here. So let's say you review this form and something just didn't quite add up or you didn't understand what they were saying. You could simply ask and so that's super helpful as well. And so that is a review of our forms feature. Are there any questions about forms? All right, well, we're getting close to the end of our time together, and I want to very briefly show you elections. We have a great video tutorial on elections, so I would say if your organization wants to host a fall election and you want them to use this tool, let me know and I can share with you that video tutorial. I'll also show you where you can find that. But if you're going in to create an election, it's pretty self-explanatory. You'd click this blue button, you would name your election, you could include instructions if you wanted to, so maybe telling them to only pick one candidate or whatever the case may be. Same as an event, you're gonna wanna make sure it's active, as well as set that start and end time. This piece is really neat. You can display an alert on your organization's page so that when a member logged in, they would see that and really be reminded to um, participate in that election. Once you create the election, so we're gonna create one for fun here. Oh, one more important note, you can only allow members on the roster to vote. So if it's a membership election, you're going to want to do that for sure. If you're voting on a button design, though, for example, we actually use this tool for homecoming button designs, you wouldn't click on this. You want anyone that can access it to vote. In this case, we want just members to vote. We'll click Save. 
So we've now created the test now or created the election. Now we'll create a ballot. And so each position would be a different ballot, for example. So we'll name this, we'll say President 2020. It provides some instructions here on access restrictions. Be sure you read this so that you know what your options are. We're going to leave it as general access and save. Now that we've created the ballot, we can create the question. So we're going to say, who should we vote for? And then option one is Blaze. Option two is Dr. Jones. And we will save our two candidates there. And then a student would see this question and have the option to vote. You can create as many ballots as you want to to associate to a different election. And so once that ballot's created, you're ready to go. The results here, you would see they would, and in fact, I wish I would have used an example so you could have seen what that looks like, but you'll see percentages here. And then publishing options. You can take this link and email it to any of your members. You could just drop it in an email, say, hey, go vote for this, um, or this election's opened. Here's a link to access it. It closes on this day. And so this is a great way to promote that opportunity. You would save and then wait for the votes to come in. So again, we have a great tutorial. If you're interested in that tutorial, I'll show you where to find it really quick. When you log in to engage on the home screen, if you scroll to the very bottom, there's a campus link section in the bottom corner. The very last button says managing your student org virtually. If you click on that, that's going to take you to a resource on our SIL website. We'll wait for it to load here. If you scroll down on that page, you're going to see there's a number of tutorials. Um, one of those is org elections. And if it'll load, there'll be a video guide for how to conduct an org election. So it's a step-by-step, -step, much more in-depth than what I just showed you. There's other tools here that are helpful as well. So a lot of what we went over today, for example, roster updates, there's video tutorials to walk you through that. So let's say you really learned a lot today, but you want to share this information and have that knowledge transfer with your students. Um, let's say you forgot one step or, or you took notes, but really don't want to have to type those up. Come in and look at these videos first because you could likely just share these videos by clicking share and sending that link to your student leaders so they would also have access to a lot of these same resources. And so with that, we have walked through every feature management tool within the Engage organization view. There are a lot of other things in Engage that are so helpful. I did want to leave the last five minutes for our questions, so consider this your introduction to Engage management today. If you have specific Engage questions, know I'm always open and really happy to help you navigate the platform. It's something I'm really passionate about because I, I see it as a resource for the work I do as an organization advisor every day. You know, I think anytime we have a website or a platform like this, it should be a tool to support our work, not to create work and to make things more difficult. And for me personally, I've found that this really opens up a lot of opportunities for me to connect with students in ways I previously couldn't. And I hope that you'll have that same experience. With that, we have five minutes left. I'd love to open it up. If there's any questions, you're welcome to submit that in chat or unmute yourself. All right, so hopefully there's not any questions. I do hope this has been a good use of your time today. Thank you for the support you provide to our student organization community. Um, well, actually we might have got something. Oh, no questions. Um, again, it's been my pleasure to walk y'all through the platform. I'm always here as a resource if you need anything. So thanks for joining us this afternoon and have a great rest of your day.